Hello, dear friends. I want to share with you a passage from Rumi's great mystical epic in six books. He didn't finish it, but I don't think he could have finished it. It could have gone on forever. But thank God we have those six glorious books because it has so many marvelous stories and so many marvelous revelatory mystical passages in it. And here is a passage that I've called The Housewife and the Chickpea. One of the things that you come to learn about Rumi when you plunge into him is how much he relished the joys of the world. And one of the joys of the world, as we all know, is eating. And one of the most celebrated and honored people in his entourage was the cook of the Sufi order, because Rumi understood, of course, that cooking is an alchemical process, and that if you really enter into the depths of what you're doing when you're cooking, you understand a great deal about what the divine is doing in life, cooking you. So here is this poem that reveals in a very playful but very profound way the deepest meaning of suffering, and especially the suffering of the dark night. Look at the chickpea in the pot, how it jumps when it's put into the fire. When you boil the water it's in, the chickpea leaps to the top of the pot and cries out, why are you burning me? Wasn't it enough to buy me? Why do you also have to afflict me? The housewife continues to push it down with her spoon. Be still and boil well. Don't jump far from the one who makes the fire. I don't boil you because I hate you. I boil you to acquire taste and savor so you can become food and mingle with life. Your affliction doesn't come from being despised. When you were fresh and green, you drank water in the garden. You drank water then to prepare you for this fire. The mercy of God precedes God's affliction. God's mercy has always preceded God's anger. So you can obtain life's authentic wealth. Chickpeas, you boil in trials and sufferings, so neither self nor existence may remain in you. Become food. Become strength. Become fine thoughts. You were weak as milk. Become jungle lion. It's an amazing, amazing poem, because if you really, really pay deep attention to each nine, you realize that there is a comprehensive, noble, grand, and supremely true teaching about why suffering comes along the path. It's not a punishment. It's an opportunity to deepen our trust in love, to become infinitely more compassionate ourselves, and to learn through sometimes very difficult experience just how strong we really are when we rest in the depths of ourselves and in the depths of that deathless consciousness that is our original blessing. And if you can approach suffering in the way that this poem invites us to approach suffering, 
then you come to a very strange understanding, which is that suffering is as great grace in its way as joy and revelation, because it works directly on removing from us the illusions, the fantasies, the narcissism, the selfishness that keeps us from realizing who we really are, which is nothing less than the divine, the divine self incarnate. First, he begins by showing us the housewife pudding the chickpeas into the boiling water and the chickpeas complaining as we all do complain when things get dark and rough. Why are you burning me? Wasn't it enough to buy me? Why do you also have to flick me? And the realism of Rumi shows us that that kind of crying out, which is essentially, why me, why me? doesn't get a direct answer because what usually happens when you cry out like that is that you shove more into the experience. Not because God's cruel, but because God wants you to find out the kernel of the experience, the depth of the experience. And if you continue to pray and to open to divine wisdom, you hear in the middle of your pain what the housewife says to the chickpea. Be still and boil well. You're not going to get out of the boiling water, so go quiet and let the mystery of this alchemy of suffering work on you. Boil well. Don't jump around. Be still, surrender, accept. Something amazing is afoot. Don't jump far from the one who makes the fire. When people come to me and say that they're in extreme affliction, I say this is a time to pray more intensely than you've ever prayed before so that you can get into connection through grace with the deepest meaning of why this suffering has come to you. Don't jump far from the one who makes the fire. Take the experience of the fire as an invitation to go deep into adoration and prayer so that the fire itself can reveal to you the meaning of why it's burning you. And that's exactly what she reveals to the chickpea. I boil you to acquire taste and savor. Suffering is sent to us to make us richer, deeper, kinder, wiser, more sober, more generous human beings, to have taste and savor, and also to come into a mysterious understanding of the dance of opposites that is reality, and so trust reality in all of its dances, knowing that they all what we call good and what we call bad, what we call lovely and what we call ugly and what we call agony and what we call this. They all, all, all of them come from the one and are all sacred. And then she says something really amazing. She says, when you were fresh and green, you drank water in the garden. When we began the search, and I don't know if this is true for you, it certainly was true for me. I had many, many amazing experiences. And idiotically, I thought, well, this is how it's going to be for the rest of my life. It's going to be blissful. <laughs> but those experiences of bliss and joy and revelation, the beginning of the path on honeymoon period, and they're very important because they fill you with the joy of the divine. But when the divine gets serious about truly transforming all of you into itself. It has to work on everything in you that separates you from the divine, your shadows, your traumas, your traumas, your 
selfishness, your narcissism, all the rest of the nonsense that we all have as human beings, and then the trial part, but they're not done out of cruelty. They're done so that one day, with them purified from you, you can have the most complete union and joy imaginable. His mercy has always preceded his anger, so you can obtain life's authentic wealth. The joy that you have at the beginning in the honeymoon is nothing compared to the joy that comes as the marriage of you and God deepens, and as you realize that God is as much God and as much love in your sufferings as God is in your joys, that prepares a much deeper, richer wine of joy. And then he turns directly to all of us, and especially all of us, I believe, in this very painful, tragic, desperate, frightening transition that everyone is in at this moment, the transition from one human race to another through the global dark night. And he says, chickpeas you boil in trials and sufferings, so neither self nor existence may remain in you. We're going through this global dark night, not as a punishment, but as a staggering, ferocious, amazing opportunity to learn that our understanding of our own separate identity is fantasy, that actually we are nothing less than the divine itself that exists far beyond any understanding of self that we have ever had. And it exists beyond any understanding of existence that we have in a mystery that can never be explained, but can, thank God, and I mean thank God, be lived. He's saying these trials and sufferings are designed perfectly. I know they're dreadful, I know they're difficult. To cook you into your divine human being beyond any understanding of identity that you have now and beyond any understanding of life that you have now. It's what will be given to you if you boil well is that you will come into your divine truth and realize your deathless nature beyond any individual claiming of it and in union with absolutely everything that exists. And then he ends this amazing passage with an invitation for us to become food, become strength, become fine thoughts. Because if we learn how to suffer in this way, gratefully and with humility and with adoration and with a yearning that will be fulfilled by grace to know the meaning of the suffering, that will make us food that mingles with life, that feeds and inspires and encourages other people. That will make us strong because we'll be strong, not with the strength of the precarious, fragile, hysterical ego, but with the strength of the incarnated divine self. And that will make our minds luminous God minds, radiating, beautiful, holy, invigorating, regenerating thought. He ends this passage by saying, you were weak as milk. You didn't realize that. You thought you were strong and on top of the world and rah, 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 but you were actually weak as milk because you were living in your ego. But now through this great alchemy of pain, and suffering given to you by love and designed by love. Now you are a jungle lion. Nothing will defeat you. Nothing will tame you. 
nothing will silence you. Nothing will enslave you. You will live as the jungle lion lives, noble, wild, holy, powerful, and free. <laughs>